I'm really excited about the material that uh, I get to share with you today as we move into 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to begin at verse 8 and we're going to go down through and include uh, verse uh, 19. It is a phenomenal passage uh, as you get into it. And the subject is uh, about being and doing. And again, we're developing and t attempting to develop language, uh, a variety of vocabulary, in order to talk about the doing and the being experience. We're looking for clarity, and we're discovering that in any area of life that you want to go into, and in any area you want to discuss, any aspect of living you want to discuss, you come back to the central thing seems to be uh, what we are being rather than what we are doing. And you realize we are so into the doing thing. Uh, our favorite statement to each other is, well, how are you doing? We never ask, how are you being? See, we have forgotten that we are human beings, not human doings. Uh, this is all about what we are being. It's all about nature inside. It's all about who we are possessed with. It's all about sourcing. Now again, and we have said this over and over again, but it just seems to be so vital to what we're trying to discuss and for clarity. We want you to grasp this concept that this is not about do-nothingism. Obviously, there's no way to come to a place where we are rag dolls and do nothing. Obviously, this is not proposing laziness. Obviously, what we're into is not saying, hey, lean back, fold your arms, uh, let things slide, it doesn't matter, uh, be non-concerned, you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we're not advocating that. Obvious, obviously, we're not advocating that you should worry. We're or advocating you should get stuck on Jesus, wrapped up in Jesus, focused on Jesus, all into Jesus. Let Jesus be your life. Oh, embrace Jesus. Just get so filled with Him. Just be in Him. And somehow, out of that, there spills all of the doing that is necessary. So the issue about being and doing is the issue of sourcing. What sources you? What produces you? What's the motive within you? What nature are you living out of? Are you living out of the self-centered nature, the demonic nature, or are you living out of the nature of Christ himself? That really is the issue. So we're looking at a variety of places uh, in the Word of God and developing a variety of language and words that bespeak the idea of the being and the doing. Uh, what we're looking at today, and uh, probably in another class period as well, is really found in your textbook, Being What You've Become. And you may want to turn there and discover the chapter on Be a Lover. And if you will go there, you will find a chart, and we're going to be walking through that chart and surrounding that chart with information that will be coming to us from the Word of God. We're really excited about Be a Lover. Not just do lovely things. This is not Boy Scout attempt. Hey, be prepared. Uh, do the right thing. Do one good deed a day. We're not into that. This is not express love. Bite your lip. Uh, produce it as best you can. We'll do loving deeds regardless of how you feel. Cover how you feel. Uh, cover over your prejudices. Recognize what's right and wrong and cling to the right and uh, shove away the wrong and bite your lip and Keep it under control and take a cold shower and discipline yourself. Obviously, that's not what we're de dealing with. What we're dealing with is literally being love inside. See, it's one thing for you to love for Jesus. I know I'm supposed to love everybody. I should love everybody. I try to love everybody. Well, I want to love everybody, but there's some people I just can't love. So what am I supposed to do? I cannot help the way I feel, so I have to cover the way I feel. I have to cover it up, and I have to bury it, and I have to not show it as best I can. And yet, it keeps leaking through. What we're dealing with, that's the doing approach. But what we're dealing with is the being approach. Which is actually the love of God filling you and sourcing you. Until through your life, there begins to spill the supernatural love of God. That literally engulfs everybody. That sees them. You begin to see them as God sees them because you now have his eyes. And you are being a lover rather than doing loving things. Now, that's our passage. 1 John chapter 4. I'd like to spend uh, time in this class period 
reading this passage. In fact, if nothing else were said, if we just spent our time reading it again and again and again, and there's something about reading it out loud that makes it impactive, that just speaks to my heart. What a passage this is. Listen to the words. We're at 1 John uh, chapter 4. Uh, let's go down to verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. What a passage that is. My dad taught me well about many things as I was growing up. One thing he taught me was, if you're going to do anything, uh, it's worth doing well. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. So if you're going to do anything, give it all you got. Go for it. Give it the gusto. Give it your best shot. Hey, really focus in. Pour yourself out. Don't do anything haphazardly just to go along. It's good advice. Um, he taught me an example of that. He said a good example of that is uh, what he called the Dagwood Sandwich. Now, I realize that if you're probably a young person, you've never heard of the Dagwood Sandwich. But, of course, in the comics, in the newspaper, there was this guy by the name of Dagwood. And Dagwood had this famous sandwich that he would eat. Uh, what he did is he got up in the middle of the night, and he would come down the stairway and, of course, stub his toe, and you know how that hurts, and go, all th go through all the rigmarole of getting to the refrigerator and... Finally, when he got to the refrigerator, he'd open it up and he'd bring out all the leftovers. And they'd be stacked all over the counter of the, of the uh, kitchen. And as he stacked these up, he would get a big plate and he'd get two slices of bread. And he'd put uh, the necessary ingredients on the bread and then he'd begin to get the leftovers. There was all, of the, all the leftover uh, spaghetti and the leftover uh, spinach and the leftover whatever. And he'd just begin to pile it on and put the meat in it and everything he wanted and that sandwich it would just grow and of course it would be about a foot thick and impossible to eat you know and he'd have these two slices of bread it was a Dagwood sandwich and of course what happened when you tried to bite into that sandwich on this side you obviously had to lean over the plate with your elbows on the table because when you bit into this side of the sandwich half of it was going to come out the other end and you were going to lose half of it. And the only thing that made it a sandwich instead of a plateful was the fact that you had two slices of bread. It was the Dagwood sandwich. Now, of course, I know that uh, John, in his writing of this epistle, did not know about the Dagwood sandwich. I know that. But it's interesting that as you look at this passage, you find this phenomenal Dagwood sandwich of love. It's about a foot thick. It's so big you can't bite into it without losing half of it on the other side. It's so amazing because it has all the necessary ingredients in it. It has everything you need planted in it. Everything that you need, that elements of the love of God, all that he wants you to have, all that he wants you to be, all that should be spilling out of you is found in this passage. What an amazing passage it is. It's the love sandwich. And I get the feeling that if we could ever devour this sandwich, and maybe a better way to express it is, oh, if the sandwich could devour us. 
And I know that's opposite, but and that's the kingdom for you, isn't it? If somehow, some way, we could be literally devoured by this concept. If it could just, if the, if the amazing essence of the love of God could possess us like this is talking about. If, if we could get into the love of God like this. Oh, we wouldn't just do some lovely deeds. We would actually be lovers. The love of God would actually be ours. We would be possessed. We would be stimulated, we motivated, we would be driven by the actual love of God that would move our world. What a tremendous love sandwich he's given to us. Now, as you look at the chart, you'll notice that we have uh, tried to draw a, uh, a sandwich. And of course, uh, there, a sandwich requires two slices of bread. So you'll notice at the top and at the bottom of the sandwich, there is this, there, there is this bread quality. Now, the reason the bread quality is so important is because it's the stabilizer. See, the bread quality reaches out and holds everything else together. So, in other words, if you don't have the bread quality, it's just kind of loose and everywhere. So, what holds it together, causes it to make sense, brings it into the quality of a sandwich, is this bread quality. Now, John has given us the bread quality. 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Ha! Huh. What an amazing statement. God is love. Now, you'll notice he doesn't just give that to us once. You'll notice down in verse 16, he turns around and gives it to us again. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. God is is love. Verse 8, verse 16. Now that forms the bread quality. In other words, one slice of bread, God is love. Then he ends this passage in verse 16 by God is love. And that forms the bread quality, two slices of bread. Now everything that's in between these two verses, 4 and 16, these two slices of bread, is going to be held together by this great statement. In other words, the only reason these other verses and these other things that he says in these verses make sense is because of this one dynamic bread quality. God is love. Everything has to be seen in light of that statement. Everything has to be understood in light of that statement. If you don't grasp this, you are going to have a sandwich. Everything will just be loose, falling apart. The only thing that holds all of this together in the human life is this overwhelming factor. God is love. When you miss that, theology disintegrates. When you miss that, you get off on tangents. When you miss that, hey, you've gone down a rabbit's trail. When you miss that, you are in chaos. What brings things together, what masters things and makes things make sense, every bit of our theology hangs on. God is love. Tremendous statement. Now you'll know that there are there are, you will note there are two dynamic statements that are given to us in the scriptures about God. One of them we've just given, of course, God is love. But there's another statement. God is holy. Because we're always talking about holiness. Holiness is the very essence of Christianity itself. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Holiness is fundamental. Holiness is basic in everything that's going on. Holiness really, 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 really does matter. Holiness is absolutely essential. And he gives us these two statements about God. God is holy and God is love. Now you recognize that the verb is is a verb of being. So we're not discussing here what God does. We're certainly not discussing activities of God. We're not discussing things that God has accomplished. We're not discussing those kinds of activities which God does towards an individual. We're discussing the essence of his being. This is the internal nature of his very structure. This is the fiber that weaves its way through his whole being. God is love. God is holy. Now, does this mean that God's nature is dual, uh, is two, is by? Does this mean that half of God is love and half of God is holy? What is his nature like? 
Does it mean that sometimes he acts out of love? Sometimes he acts out of holiness? What is this God is love, God is holy kind of stuff? You know, it's a statement of the same identical thing. God is love. God is holy. It's another way of saying the same thing. In other words, love and holiness are equated. You cannot divide them. You cannot slice them. They are elements of the same thing. They are simply different labels for the same ingredient. Love, holy. In fact, we call holiness perfect love because that's the essence of who God is. He's holy. He's love. What a phenomenal statement. And it's interesting that that's what John highlights in terms of God. God is love, therefore God is holy. Now the interesting thing about the statement is God is, that's a, that's a verb of being. Not, a, not an action verb, but a verb of being. God is love. Now since that's a verb of being, one thing I learned in school was that anytime you have a verb of being, you immediately want to cross it out and put an equal sign above it. And the reason you do that is to discover whether it is a whether you have a predicate noun that follows. In other words, God is love. What's this love business? Well, you strike out the verb and you put an equal sign. And if it makes sense, then you've got a predicate noun. God equals love. Now, what a predicate noun means is that the noun, the predicate noun, God is love, predicate noun, is the same as the subject. In other words, they're equal. In other words, this is not an adjective, this is a noun. This is not an adjective that describes God. This is not an adjective that describes or gives quality to God. This does not give you something of the content of God. In other words, this isn't God is loving. God does lovely things. God is a loving person. That's not what's being described here. What's being described is God is love. In other words, it's the essence of God, equal with God. In fact, you are capable in this kind of statement of flipping the statement and literally saying love equals God. Love is God. God is love. Now, the same thing is true with holy. God is holy. Holy is God. It's, it's the same. It's equal. So you've got three things going on that are all equal. Statements all for the same thing. Love, God, holy. All three statements, all three words are labels for the same identical thing. Only we shouldn't say, say thing. We should say person. Because what we're dealing with is not a force, not an ingredient, not a substance. We're dealing with the person. And the person is love. Now, that's a little hard for us to grasp in our culture. The reason being that love is some kind of a tickle up and down your spine. It's some kind of a sentimentality. It's some kind of a, a feeling that you have. It's some kind of an emotional thing. It's some kind of a thing you make love. See, we, we, we've, dis, we've really demolished the word. But in a biblical sense, what you're talking about, it's not an ingredient, not an activity. You're talking about a person, a person who's God. And at the heart of the universe, he's telling us, there is this person of God, not a force, not an ingredient, not an idea, not a concept. At the heart of the universe is this is this person, this living person, and his name is God, and he is love. Now, if you take God is love and you flip it, love is God, we're not talking about, oh, God then is a force, God is a tickle up and down your spine. No, no. Love is God. In fact, love is bigger than God. Therefore, love has mastered God. Therefore, God is love, and God, love is God, because love is so powerful that it literally controls God, literally infiltrates his whole being, literally masters him. It's incapable for, God is incapable of doing anything but loving. Therefore, since God can't do anything but love, and he's absolutely mastered by love, then God isn't God. Love is God. Only love is a person, and his name is God. So what we've got going on is, at the heart of the universe, we've got this dynamic person called God who is absolutely mastered, possessed, 
person and love is that person. So love is not a force. Love is not ingredients. Love is not emotion. Love is not something out there. Love is the essence of the person of God himself. So to possess love is to possess God and God alone. In fact, there's no way to have the love we're talking about without actually being possessed by the nature of the one who is love, which is God himself. So how can I receive love? And how can I possibly be a loving person? Should I go out and do loving things? Will that make me a loving person? Oh, in the eyes of some people, oh, I treat them nice, I'm so loving towards them, so they think I'm a loving person. But see, they don't so see me in all circumstances, in all expression of emotions, in all attitudes. See, they don't see the totality of my being. They say a few actions that I perform for them. But that's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible is not giving you a list of things that you should do which will be loving activities towards another, and therefore you will be a loving person. That's not what the Bible's doing. The Bible is presenting to you the very essence of the person himself. The who is love, God, who is love. And somehow when you get into the person, better than that, somehow when the person gets into you, and when you and the person of God come together in the dynamic of oneness and an intimacy and his nature becomes your nature and his drive becomes your drive and his desires become your desires. Out of that, there begins to spill this phenomenal love and you become what God is. No, not you become like you do it separate from him. It's that in the unity of him, he literally now can express himself through you and you become the love of God to your world because that's who he is. And the only way you can get that is not to do a series of things, but to actually be possessed by him that you might actually be the representative, the flow of his life, the stage upon which he acts, the body that he literally t lives in, the skin he wears to literally demonstrate who he is to your world. God is Love. God is holy. Now it's interesting that the uh, Greek word for love here is the Greek word agape. You're familiar with that. You know that love in the English language is really thin. And we've talked about this so many times in a variety of places. But the love of God is, the, 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 the word love in the English language is, is just, it's just so thin. And the love of God is way beyond that. But love doesn't quite express what's going on here, that word. Why? Because the content of it has diminished. So what we really need to do if we're going to use the word love is, we're going to have to beef up the content. We're going to have to grasp anew and afresh in our thinking hearts and minds. We're going to have to grasp the content of the love that's really being expressed here. You know, in the English language, love is just really used in a variety of ways. For instance, uh, I come to you and uh, you say to me, I love you. And I look at you and say, well, that's nice, but I heard you say that about your dog, too. Well, I do love my dog. Well, I heard you say that about pizza, too. Well, I really do love pizza. And I heard you say that about your truck. Oh, I do love my truck. And I heard you say that about a variety of other things as well. So on what do you say, I love my wife? You even talk about making love. So where exactly, when you turn to me and say, I love you, where exactly do I fit in all of that? Uh, where's my place? What are you really trying to say to me? How do you, do you feel about me like you feel about your dog? What, what is going on? That's the dilemma in the English language. Now, you know in the Bible, the Greek language, that there were four distinct words that are given to us for love. Actually, only three of them are used in the New Testament. But in the Greek language, there were four words. One, of course, was erotic love. It was, it, it's, the, it's, it's the stripped down, basic essence of the word itself, which literally is the sexual kind of attraction, that kind of love. That word is never used in the scriptures. But the other three are. 
What is the Greek word stergo? That word has to do with family kind of love. It has to do with uh, a father, son, mother, daughter, uh, family kind of stuff. You're within the family. Love. Stergo. Another Greek word for love is phileo. You know it well. It's the Philadelphia kind of love. It's the brotherly love. It means a real affection between two individuals. It's an affection of, of togetherness and an affection of care and concern and, and, a, and a deep internal uh, gripping and coming together of two individuals, brothers, uh, phileo. But then there's this agape. Now agape is different, definitely different in the New Testament. Agape gives expression to a whole new realm. In fact, when they wanted to come to talk about God's love for us, it's like they went back into the Greek language and took a word that wasn't used very often, that no one had ever remembered, and they dug it up, no doubt under the inspiration of the Spirit. They dug up this word and gave the content to it, agape love, to talk about God is love, agape. What the word means is, that it's a non-emotional kind of love. And that may turn you off. That may sound negative to you. But what that means is it's not an up and down, not a romantic, not a feel, not stimulated high at one moment, low at another moment, but a consistent kind of aggressive love that's spilled out for you. And that it's not determined by what you do for me and how you make me feel. And it's not determined by, oh, if you treat me nice, I have these emotional feelings about you. Uh, it, it has to do with not you at all, but about me. I am love. And if I am love, if I agape you, then that doesn't have to do with what you do towards me. That has to do with what I've decided in my own mind and in my own heart about how I feel about you. And I have decided I love you. And that is going to be consistent regardless of what you do or what you say or what you don't do or, do or say. I'm going to love you. And whether you want it or not, there's going to come after you. There's going to come to you this agape kind of love. Love that says, hey, I will not let you go. And I'm always going to be thinking in terms of what is best for you. I will not think in terms of how I can use you. What would be best for me? Uh, what angle do I have? There will be no hidden agenda. My love for you is going to be way beyond an emotional kind of thing, way beyond what you do or don't do. It's going to be not determined by you, but determined by me. Therefore, since this love has never been created by you, you will not be able to stop me from loving you. In other words, nothing you've ever done has been good enough to cause me to love you, God says. Therefore, nothing you will ever do will ever be bad enough to cause me not to love you because this is not about you. This is about me, and I've decided I'm going to love you. So that's the way it is. Now, you can get over into your corner and have your little pity party and say, oh, nobody loves me, and you can really feel sorry for yourself. But the truth of the matter is, there is coming at you a roaring, consistent, always there, pressing, banging on your door, God, who is absolutely in love with you, agape style, and will not let you go. Because God is love. Now, you can go to the bank on that. That will never change. Well, but I haven't treated God very well. That is totally beside the point. Because this is not about you. This is about him and how he feels and what's going on in him. And what is taking place in his nature towards you. God is love. So when John comes to write to us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16 and says, God is love, that's what he's talking about. Not sentimentality, not emotional feelings, not up and down, but this agape love that is the essence of the nature of God. It is the thread that ties everything in the life of God together. 
And it's absolutely impossible for God to do anything but love you because it's the internal essence, the nature of his being, the fiber of his system. It literally weaves itself through his whole being, pulls him together. It makes him who he is. And the minute you take that away from him, you don't have God. You've got something else on your hands because this is the bare essential essence of God himself. Wow, what a Jesus we have. What a God we have on our hands. God is love. Now, if you follow me that far, I want to take you another step. You recognize that God has omni qualities. For instance, God is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. Uh, God is all uh, everywhere at one time. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He has these omni qualities. And if we were to take a piece of paper and we were to list all the qualities that God has, we would list them one by one by one. One of those qualities would not be love. Because you see, love is not what he has. Love is who he is. Whoa, that is so important. Love is who he is, not what he has. Now, the reason that is so important and in another course, we will get into who Jesus is. But you realize that God has certain things, but he is love. And God can give up what he has without giving up who he is. And when you come to the incarnation, when you come to Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, leaped off of his throne, gave up what he has, came to earth, but he never gave up who he is in the incarnation. In the incarnation, who he is was stable. He remained the person of God. He did not give up what he is. He gave up the qualities that he had. For instance, Jesus leaped off of his throne. He's God. He has omnipresence. He's become a man. He's now limited in one spot like you are as a man in the human flesh. He gave up or set aside, oh, it's still his, but he set it aside and said, I'm not going to use it because that's omnipresence and I have that as God, so it's mine, but I'm not going to use it. So he limited himself to be in one spot as you are. He did the same thing with all the omni qualities of his life. He gave up what he had, set them aside, refused to use them, but what he is remained steady. So what came to earth is who he is. Well, who is he? God is love. Oh, the great Wesley hymn, And Can It Be, the second verse. He left his Father's throne above, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and died for Adam's race. He gave up what he had, but he did not give up who he is. What a Jesus. What a Jesus. There's the sacrifice for you. God is love. Pure, absolute love. Agape love. Not love that's up and down. Not love that floats here and there. Not love that you can stimulate. Not love you do something bad, I won't love you. Not that kind of love. Love that is, hey, not dependent upon you, but dependent upon himself who he is in the essence of his own nature. you got to grasp this. This will change your life. And it's in that redemptive kind of love that love would not let him set us, that God, love would not let him set idly by. It required redemption. It drove him out. It moved him in your direction. God is love. So this is unconditional love. Now, this is vital for understanding who God is. This means that God's love is unconditional, meaning God's love is not conditioned upon you. It's only conditioned upon who he is, and he remains the same. Therefore, what we're dealing with is that God's love is unconditional, without exception, never varies, will not change, is not up and down, nothing you can ever do will affect how God feels about you. God is love, unconditional love. 
Do you know how rare that is? In fact, in reality, if you ever experience unconditional love, it will be because God is present in whomever you experience that from. There is no unconditional love even capable. No one is capable of unconditional love outside of God himself. So the only way I'm ever going to be able to ex be the expression of this unconditional love is God must indwell me. I must be indwelt by the person of God himself. Unconditional love. Whoa. What a phenomenal concept that is. That God is not keeping track. God is not loving you sometimes, not loving you others. That if you find the worst sinner in the whole entire world, God loves him. If you find the greatest saint you've ever seen, God loves that individual. In fact, he loves the saint the same as he loves the sinner. They are the same because God is love and his feelings don't change because this is not dependent upon you or that other individual. It's dependent upon God, his nature, who he is. And who he is, oh God, is love. It's the essence of his life. Now, we've said this several times, but this is so important. You've got to grasp this. This is life-changing. This is fundamental to everything that's going on in our lives and in what we believe. And it's the fact that fundamental in God is this nature, this this internal nature, he cannot change. It's, it's, he is incapable of doing anything but love. And what you are and what you do does not affect his love. So regardless of how bad you've been or how bad you are, he loves you. Regardless of how good you are or how good you've been, he loves you. It, that doesn't affect it because it's not about you. It's about him and who he is and what he's decided he's going to do towards you. And he's decided he's going to love you and nothing in you can stop that. Again, nothing in you has ever been good enough to make God love you. So nothing in you will ever be bad enough to make God not love you. Because this is not about you. This is about him and what he's decided to do. Because this is the essence of his nature. God is love. God is love. The amazing love of God. Would you crawl up in his arms? Would you give your whole life to him? Well, how do I know I can trust him? Oh, a God who feels this way about you, you could trust. See, it's the conditional love that we can't trust. It's that, well, if I do the right thing, then he loves me. If I, did, if I go to the right place, then he loves me. If I pray enough, then he loves me. If I give enough money, then he loves me. If I witness for him, then he loves me. If I do the right things, then he loves me. That kind of love, you never know whether you've done the right thing. See, that's the doing kind of love. That's love that's based upon doing. And if I do the right thing, but then when it comes right down to it, who's ever done the right thing enough? So if you could find out what the right thing to do is, go and do it, you'd still die and go to hell. Because this is not about doing the right thing. This is about embracing the God who is love, which is unconditional, which is being. So salvation and all of Christianity, the fundamental of Christianity, the very heart and soul of Christianity, is contained within the idea of literally being engulfed with, filled by, taking on the nature of, we have become partakers of the divine nature. Literally being overwhelmed with the very person of the God who is love. God is love. God is holy. Hey, there is nothing outside of that. Only then do you begin to grasp what John is trying to tell us. In verse 8 and in verse 16, God is love. Now, you know that they divided the scriptures into dispensations. And I never use the term because I can't spell it, but dispensational stuff. In the Old Testament, there's this God who sits on the throne, or God who sits on Mount Sinai, and he belches out the law of God. And what's that law all about? It's a desperate attempt on God's part to communicate to us who he is. In other words, God is holy. 
Well, what does that mean? God is holy. I have no idea what that means. So God says, I'm going to write it down on paper. And the way I'm going to try to relate it to you is, I'm going to write it on tablets of stone. And these are commandments. These are, this is how I would act if I were in your shoes. If I lived in your home, married to your wife, with your kids, in your society, here's how I would act. This would be an expression of holiness. God is holy. Now remember, holy love are the same. So here's God saying, I want to communicate to you what I am in my inner being. I am holy. And here's how I would act if I were in your shoes. Now that didn't communicate too well because we couldn't pull that off. And we ended up basically messed up in sin. But then Jesus came. And Jesus, what's that all about? A whole nother realm of communication. God has said, I'm not communicating now from Mount Sinai by writing stuff down. But I want you to know I'm a holy God. And here's how a holy God acts. Now remember, holy and love are the same. So as you look at Jesus, what are you seeing? You're seeing the very nature of God expressed. So if you want to see what God is love is really all about, you look at Jesus. And in Jesus is the pure, the visible demonstration of the invisible God who is love. Here's how God acts in the flesh. Here's what love is really all about. Here's dying on a cross, forgiving your enemies. Here's by constantly pouring your life out, never ever living for yourself. Here's the essence of the nature of God. Here's what God is love really means. Now, you realize that then Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he gathered up the promise of the Father. And poured that promise all over us. And we received the fullness of his nature. So in the book of Acts, you find this phenomenal outspill of the nature of God through the lives of men and women. And what is being demonstrated through them? God is love. God is holy. Through them is this demonstration of a God who has unconditional, without reservation, no strings attached kind of love. Love that is not determined by what you do to me, but love that is determined by who he is in me and what he's decided to be in me, his nature living within me. And in the confines of that nature, the nature of God who is love, there begins to spill through the believer this unconditional love that moved their world. God is love. Love is God. Unconditional, without reservation. Not what he does, not actions of doing, not certain things accomplished, but internal nature, being. So God has called us to be lovers, not to do loving things, not to find a list of lovely activities that will attract people, not to try to, to convince some people that we love them because we do certain things towards them, not to bite our lip and say, well, okay, I won't say that because they wouldn't think I love them. This is about being possessed by the God who is love, not doing the loving thing, but being now. Obviously, if you're going to be love, out of you is going to spill these lovely activities. Spontaneous activities, flowing activities, embracing activities, the wonder of the love of God embracing your fellow man. All because God is love. We're confronted with an issue. Are you filled with that love? Meaning, are you filled with him? Jesus, we bow in your presence. No way to accomplish this. Can't do it. Can't pull it off. Have to be it. And can't be it except you, oh, who are. You are the being one. Would you come and be in me who you are? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.